gut and the brain. Um, and this slide doesn't, you know, it just doesn't require any memorizing of information here for anybody that's not knowledgeable really about maybe digestion and medical conditions involving the gut or the brain. Uh, but just to really highlight that there is this bi-directional interplay going in both directions between the brain and the gut, and then also between the gut microbiome and the gut, and then between the gut microbiome and the brain. So it's really complicated. All things are influencing each other. And really just to show that everything is integrated in the body. And when it comes to our nutrition, it's not just a matter of knowing what is healthy and therefore eating it because there's so many psychological factors and I'll mostly be talking about stress today, but also anxiety, depression, or other psychiatric conditions that can influence what we choose to eat, how we might break down and metabolize the food that we eat, how our gut functions, you know, whether we have digestive um, disturbances of any type, and also the crosstalk between the gut microbiome, which is all the bacteria, viruses, and um, fungi that live in the gut, and how they influence maybe different chemicals and hormones and inflammatory markers that are produced that then signal back to the brain and back to the gut. So again, just to highlight that this is a really complex interrelationship going on. So I want to help you understand the stress eating cycle. And I think this is really important to put things into perspective. And this is sort of a pathway that many of us can probably relate to experience, if not very regularly, at least occasionally. So um, I'm kind of using interchangeably here, emotional eating or stress eating, because they are sort of um, similar. When we experience any degree of psychological distress, so that could be uncomfortable emotions, stress, anxiety, et cetera, that stimulates what we call the HPA axis, which is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which goes from our brain down to our adrenal glands of the kidneys. And that signals the release of the stress hormone cortisol. And cortisol then floods our body and it is responsible for triggering the fight or flight response. So this is literally preparing the body to either fight or flee a situation that it perceives as being threatening. And this stress response was once upon a time really useful when we were maybe um, on a regular basis encountering very acute, full, threatening and stressful situations like when our ancestors were maybe living in the wild and encountering like a tiger. <laughs> um, so then you would literally need to flee the situation and the cortisol send signals to the rest of the body to um, help do that. And that also decreases serotonin levels, which is a feel good neurotransmitter responsible for feelings of well being calm and happiness, because you don't want to feel those emotions when you're in a very acute, acute, stressful or threatening situation. But the response is not really any different today, even though we're not maybe encountering those very acute and stressful threatening situations. If we're just undergoing low-grade chronic stress, like for students, maybe encountering stress around exams or deadlines, just daily work stress, we still get this cortisol response. And it's still having the same effect in our body and decreasing serotonin levels in the brain so that we don't feel so at ease. And this triggers our body to, our brain to crave sugar and highly palatable foods. And highly palatable usually indicates foods that are either high in sugar and or fat because they send signals to the brain um, that literally helps us feel better. So that's driven by insulin, re insulin release after eating the foods um, because they ca cause a spike in blood sugar levels. Insulin gets released to deal with the blood sugar. And that insulin doesn't just deal with blood sugars. It also helps those neurotransmitters to be produced again in the brain. So serotonin and dopamine, which help us feel good, relaxed, happy, et cetera. So that brings emotional comfort. And that is where the term emotional eating comes from, because literally there is a feedback to the brain that makes us feel better when eating these foods. So although that might seem, okay, that's a solution to the problem, it is only a short-term fix. Um, the feeling of well-being will wear off pretty quickly. Sometimes it's replaced with emotions such as guilt or shame um, or lack of you know, willpower because you gave in to the food and you didn't... Um, you know, stick to your healthy eating goals. And on a biological level, eating that pattern consistently every time that you feel a bit of stress will lead to health problems, insulin resistance, neurotransmitters will no longer be produced in response to the insulin. Um, so that can lead to low grade or low serotonin chronically, contributing to low mood or depression. And it's a poor stress coping mechanism. So it sets up 
an emotional eating cycle and reliance on food to try and cope with emotions. So sometimes I think it's really helpful to kind of explain the biological basis for sometimes why we crave certain foods and why we eat the way we do in these types of situations and have some understanding and maybe compassion for yourself and what your body is going through and it's just trying to cope in the best way it knows how. But it doesn't mean that's the only way. Um, and I'll walk us through some alternative pathways that we can take later on. Um, but another point about stressful times and how it can influence eating behavior is about appetite level because many people will say well they decrease they get decreased appetite and don't feel hungry when they're really stressed and that's true and research shows that about 40 percent of us maybe have decreased suppressed appetite in times of heightened stress but then about 40 percent of us still increase our food intake so that's fairly even split and then the other 20 percent of people really have maybe report no change but the important point here is that regardless of any change or no change in appetite, research shows that under acute or chronic stressful situations, people do tend to intake their in increase their intake of hyper palatable foods. So they'll still gravitate towards those unhealthy foods that we might see in the picture here that send those signals to the brain that um, they feel more comfort. So that's regardless of appetite. And the main emotional eating patterns that we tend to see are cravings and intake of high sugar, high fat foods. So that would be like chocolate, ice cream, cookies, pastries, all baked goods. Um, but some people don't have as much of a sweet tooth and their um, patterns might be more for simple, starchy, more maybe more savory carbohydrate foods like um, white bread, pasta, processed cereals, chips, etc. cetera. Um, binge eating in excess is sometimes a problem for some people and that can develop into an eating disorder of its own type. Late night snacking, often be, um, when we're under stress, our sleep can also be disrupted and people might feel the need to eat later at night, which is not the ideal time for our bodies to be digesting food. And then also related to nutrition is alcohol excess is another mechanism of coping um, with stress or other psychological issues going on um, if the stress itself is not addressed. So um, I'm now going to go into some kind of practical tips um, and tools that you might be able to use to implement healthy eating behaviors um, that can reduce our susceptibility to the stress cravings. And I'll just pause for a moment in case anybody has any questions directly related to what I just spoke about or any questions in the chat. Nothing yet. Uh, Dr. Lindsay, I have a comment about you're listing off chocolate under uh, most like not desirable foods, but maybe not now, maybe later we could also address whether there could be some instances when chocolate might be good. Yeah, of course. And um, I don't want to give the impression that chocolate is actually an unhealthy food. Um, it depends on the type of chocolate, really. <laughs> um, and yes, we could definitely talk about that later because in general, like dark chocolate going to have um, low sugar content and many health benefits with the cocoa in general, which is found in chocolate, has many health benefits. So I don't want to write off chocolate as always being bad, but um, more processed candies and maybe chocolate bars, etc., that are full of sugar and also fat, they might be more of the pattern that sometimes we see people like delving into um, with stress and juiced eating. Okay. I think there's one more. So somebody said, one of my strategies is to limit the amount of those foods in my house. So that's a really good point. And that's exactly what I'm going to get into next. So thanks for that comment. Um, okay, so the first recommendation that I would have to help you to um, break down susceptibility to stress induced eating is to improve your food environment. So if junk food is easily available to you when you are feeling pretty stressed, what are you likely to choose, you know, between these two options, for example, will you go for the more junk food type option if it's readily available to you, or will you go to the effort of maybe preparing a salad or even just reaching for a piece of fruit? Um, it might depend on how much discipline or you've done on this already, but I imagine that the majority of us will at least feel gravitated towards more of the junk food um, in those times. So 
the first really important step, if you feel like you're really struggling with implementing healthy eating and dealing with stress eating cycles, would be to remove those temptation foods from the home. And don't expect yourself to rely on willpower because willpower is tricky and even questionable of how much we have of it. Um, so just allowing yourself to make the easier choice and removing the less healthy choices is um, a great place to start. So then making healthier choices, the easier choices. This really does start with some you know, planning ahead and preparation. So thinking about, well, what would I like to eat? What out of you know, all the abundance of healthy food that's available to us, um, what would I like to start with? What would I like to equip myself with in the home um, for grocery shopping? So make a grocery list of the different foods, ingredients that appeal to you to start with, especially if you're really starting your health journey and nutrition. Um, don't expect yourself to eat everything, um, all the vegetables and fruits that you've never even tasted before, perhaps. You know, start with at least what you're comfortable with and work up from there. And don't go to the grocery store hungry, because if you do, you will be very tempted by what's in the um, all the confectionery aisle, all the sweets, all the um, more processed foods. Um, to eat them right away rather than just sticking to your grocery list. Um, be sure to stock your pantry and your fridge with healthy food items that you enjoy, like I mentioned, and also for snack options. Um, if you're somebody who likes variety in your diet, don't um, just restrict yourself to the same foods, maybe day in, day out, and you can rotate them weekly. And then keep healthy snacks in places where you might spend a lot of time, even if that's outside the home. So if you have long commutes or maybe you find that after work, you have a tendency to grab something from the vending machine or stop off at a gas station and grab some chips, for example. If you know that that's a time where you're hungry and you crave something, then have something ready in your car to eat something that's healthier, for example, maybe some nuts or a banana or another piece of fruit that's kind of easy to eat. Um, so avoiding food emergencies, and that can also apply to the workplace as well, maybe in your office. So balancing blood sugars is then a really important point to also avoid those sort of food emergencies where we really get strong cravings. Um, so this really comes down to when we feel hangry, which I think many people are familiar with this term. It can be defined as a state of anger or irritability caused by a lack of food or hunger causing a negative change in emotional state. I'm sure we've all experienced being hangry at least once in our lives, or at least know somebody that is often hangry. So big tips to avoid this happening is to eat breakfast within two hours of waking. So not to um, allow your blood sugars to dip too low, um, you know, and skipping meals, basically. Consume protein and healthy fat with breakfast. So for this is to try and avoid having purely carbohydrate-based breakfasts. So for example, of how we can combine protein and fat in a breakfast time would be to have maybe an avocado and or an egg on whole grain toast. So you have the high fiber source of bread, perhaps healthy fat and uh, protein and fat in the egg. So that really has the effect of balancing out the effect of the carbohydrate in the toast onto your blood sugar level. So it'd be slower digestion. Oatmeal adding berries, maybe different types of seeds, flaxseed is a good option, other nuts or nut butter is a way again to add some protein and fat into an otherwise largely carbohydrate meal, um, or making like a smoothie that isn't just composed of fruit, but could maybe include some vegetables, adding maybe a protein for powder, also using seeds, nuts, nut butter to add some protein and healthy fats into the smoothie as well. Um, don't skip meals, so not just breakfast, maybe don't skip lunch, because that way your blood sugars will start to drop and you'll start to feel that hangry feeling and then just reach for the more processed sugary foods. Um, but also for lunch, avoid a carb heavy lunch. So for example, having a sandwich maybe on white bread that's more um, refined carbohydrate with chips on the side, because that's a lot of carbohydrate and maybe there's not a lot of protein in the sandwich. And therefore your blood sugars will spike within a couple of hours of eating that meal, they'll crash back down really low and you'll get that hangry feeling and you might notice a slump in the mid afternoon where you feel really difficult focusing and really tired. So that tends to be seen when we have a lot of carbohydrate at lunchtime, especially for people who aren't very active during the day. And then keeping healthy snacks on standby. So here are some examples of like balanced snacks where we combine a source of protein and or fat with um, a naturally carbohydrate containing food. So fruit, for example, contains carbohydrate, balance it out with a few nuts, um, a non-flavored and plain Greek yogurt with some berries and seeds. 
have some raw veggies with hummus or guacamole, or maybe a string cheese with some type of whole grain or seeded crackers. So there's just some tips. And I also want to highlight that the connection between food and mood also works in the reverse direction. So we've kind of talked about how stress or mood states can affect what we choose to eat, but it also, we can support our mental health and reduce our susceptibility to stress and anxiety by focusing on a really healthy, diverse diet with contains all of these different nutrients listed here. And I'll give you an example of the different foods that could contain these nutrients, because many of these are involved in the stress pathway they might get depleted like magnesium gets depleted in our body when we're under stress so um replenishing that in our body through variety of foods but perhaps also supplementation can um help maintain our neurotransmitters in the desired range and then omega three fatty acids found in oily fish um, they're anti-inflammatory known to reduce risk of depression as is vitamin d big sunshine vitamin but it's also some food sources as well so just to give you some examples of these foods here, fish and seafood are rich in omega-3 fatty acids, also protein, our green leafy vegetables and beans, good sources of various B vitamins like folate and also magnesium. All types of nuts and seeds are great. Um, I've listed some top ones here for higher in omega-3 content and good fiber sources. Whole grains and oats, fiber and B vitamins. Some vitamin D rich foods include canned fish with bones. So like your sardines in a can or salmon where the bones are soft and you can actually eat them. Egg yolks, mushrooms and fortified milks. Fermented foods are things like yogurt, kefir, sauerkraut, kimchi. Um, so they contain probiotic sources so they can help feed the good bacteria in our gut which could have a beneficial impact on our mood state. And then berries and citrus fruit for vitamin C and antioxidants. Um, so also some other healthy eating tips that might apply, especially for students who are on a budget, because I know that students are often struggling, you know, with maybe different um, expenses going on in their life and not necessarily earning much money at the time. So it can be hard sometimes. We have this impression that healthy eating is expensive. And sometimes, you know, if you look at the stores like Whole Foods, yes, it's expensive to eat from foods like places like that, but there's other ways that we can still maintain healthy eating um, with more affordable. So in general, more plant-based meals and less processed food in the diet does equal more affordable. And when I say processed, that could equal takeout foods, but also like ready-made meals that you might purchase in a grocery store because they're already ma made and they have a lot of processing that's gone into them. They are more expensive because there's been more people in the food chain to get them um, on the shelf. But if you go for more whole foods, such as just whole fruits, whole vegetables, whole meats, fish, eggs, etc., they haven't had the same amount of processing. So they are actually cheaper and more nutrient dense at the end of the day. Um, for fruits and vegetables, frozen um, fruits and vegetables are equally, if not more nutritious than the fresh ones on our shelves. And they are usually more affordable as well. So that's a great way to stock up on fruits and vegetables and not risk them going off. Um, legumes also that you can get in bulk. So that, like this picture here, you'll see in some grocery stores like Sprouts, um, Mother's Market will do these bulk um, like dried beans, whole grains, nuts and seeds, and usually you just fill it up a container and that tends to be cheaper way of buying those foods than getting them in the prepackaged varieties. Shopping at farmer's markets is a great way to maybe get good value, go straight to the source. You cut out the middleman and the expenses that are involved in that and getting uh, fruits and vegetables on the grocery markets and um, going straight to your farmer's market usually is more affordable. And also if anybody's using um, food stamps like CalFresh benefits, many vendors at several farmers markets all across the state will accept CalFresh benefits. And there's even an, a new scheme called Market Match where you can even make more money at the farmers market if, you have, if you're on CalFresh benefits by getting additional tokens by at the information booth. So certain farmers markets um, provide that service. And in some of the resources that I think Sam will share later, um, is a link to some more information on that. Um, and then also going to a farmer's market, maybe towards the end of the market time, you might get good deals from farmers because they don't want to take home the food that might be left over. So they'll probably sell things off for cheaper. 
buying or cooking together with others, whether that's friends or family members, can help reduce costs as well. And cooking larger quantities and freezing portions for future meals, avoid food waste, make sure you use everything that you've purchased. And also growing simple herbs and spices at home is a great way to um, continuously have a supply of those foods without purchasing them all the time. Um, so before we move on to the next section, I just see there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I've also heard to stick to the outside perimeter of aisles and grocery stores, um, less processed foods. That's a great point. And um, yes, so when you go into a grocery store, try and avoid the aisles for most purchases. You'll find that the fruits, vegetables, even the meat, the fish, the eggs, the dairy, they all tend to be on the outside walls of the grocery store. So that's a good way to avoid um, the more processed foods that are in the internal aisles. And how do you feel about intermittent fasting? Is it healthy and or beneficial when trying to lose weight, when trying to control eating out of boredom? Um, so yes, that is a good question because I know I did make a point there of saying eat breakfast within two hours. And intermittent fasting can be a useful tool um, for some people. I don't think the jury is out yet on if there's subgroups, for example, that maybe it is not so appropriate for. I personally have a preference that pre-menopausal women, so women who still have a menstrual, menstrual cycle, probably benefit from not doing a very long fast because it does kind of interfere with hormones um, and can interfere with your menstrual cycles. So having a 12-hour fast at a minimum is really achievable for most people. So in other words, you finish eating maybe at 8 p.m., you start eating at 8 a.m. the next day. That should be doable by pretty much everybody. And I think that's a great place to start. And then if you're really on a weight loss journey and you feel that you're able to maybe extend that um, fasting window, then it's okay to try it out. But if you start to get extreme cravings, feel dizzy, lightheaded and stuff, maybe it's not for you. Maybe just having something a more like high protein, high fat breakfast and minimal carbohydrate in the morning might be a better option. And it's also good to, um, you know, maybe consider getting lab tests done with your doctor as well before embarking on something like intermittent fasting and just check, you know, our hormones and different nutrients in the right ranges. Um, so somebody asked, what about phthalates, plastic packaging? Should I use veggie wash? Um, so I think that avoid minimizing plastic packaging is definitely beneficial. There's a lot of toxins in our environment, including how foods are packaged. So um, trying to minimize it is probably helpful. Washing your veggies is definitely recommended. Um, I don't think it's always necessary to use one of those veggie washes that are on the market, even just a drop of vinegar in a big bucket of water and soaking your vegetables and fruits in that for a couple of minutes really does a good job as well. So I hope that answers those questions. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna move on to talking more about how to break the stress eating cycle. So more from a psychological perspective and behavioral perspective, what can we do? So the first step is that it begins with awareness really. Um, so maybe if everybody here could just have a bit of self-reflection on when are those times in your life when you find yourself triggered or really craving maybe high sugar, high starchy, high sugar fat foods or takeouts, etc. cetera, um, under what situations, what are the emotions that you might experience? Is there a pattern? Like, is it always for students maybe around exam time where you feel a little more stressed and anxious that you find yourself eating some of these foods more often. Um, and then acknowledging that no matter what your personal pattern is, that different types of stressors are going to continue to arise, that we can't really avoid these things in daily life. Different things are gonna come um, without our control. But what we can do is change or alter how we choose to react to those stressors when they arrive. So diverting really means finding an alternative tool in response to a stress or a difficult low mood state that we can utilize to distract ourselves from the thoughts of maybe eating something that we could be craving at that moment, even if we're not hungry. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on that in the next slide. And then reinforcing, using this new tool that we find works best for us, reinforcing it, making it a new habit, practicing it daily. And then um, at the end of this kind of pathway is to reconnect with food from a healthier perspective. So really enjoying food for what it is and not using it as a coping mechanism. So I'm gonna go into those last three points in a little bit more detail. So the diversion strategies is really just 
healthy wellness habits that don't involve food. So if you find yourself craving foods or turning to food in times of stress, maybe you also recognize, are you even hungry in those moments? If not, then food is not really required. What is required is addressing the stress or the underlying anxiety or low mood that's going on. And there's multiple ways that you could do that. For those of you involved in maybe the health and wellness studies there at Cyprus, maybe you've already explored certain options. Exercise can be a great tool for just maybe getting outside, some fresh air, taking a break, clearing your head. It doesn't have to be anything strenuous or long. It could just be a simple walk for five to 10 minutes. Deep breathing is so accessible to everybody. You can do it at any moment, even during a meeting. If you're not talking at the time on Zoom or something, you can practice deep breathing. Um, and that can really be a great way to tap into the nervous system and calm the nervous system and then think more clearly about what's going on. Um, self, more physical things like meditation or self-massage, like acupressure points can help relieve tension in the body. Journaling um, is a good way to sort of express and get things out of your head and onto paper so that they're not, um, you know, maybe going around in your head and confusing your brain signals of what it really wants. So there are just some ideas. Meditation, yoga, of course, as well, are great tools. Um, reinforcing then, creating new brain pathways is important because we all have these neural pathways in our brain, which are the neurological basis of our habits of thinking, feeling, and acting. But these pathways, they're basically operating on loops. So for example, if you're usually find that in times of intense stress um, that you crave cookies, for example, that's maybe a loop that your brain is operating on. And if the cookies are available, you're going to eat them maybe sometimes without even realizing you're doing it. But these pathways are probably called plastic because they're malleable, that we can change them. They're not set. So we can rewire or change these pathways through repetition and practice. So finding a new tool, for example, the deep breathing practice, going out and taking a walk, um, just taking a break, a timeout every time that we're feeling those emotions, instead of reacting towards the food. Um, but to really break down stress or emotional eating cycles, it's important to practice these healthy stress management tools daily. So especially when not under stress, I think that's really important to try and build this as a daily habit, even when you're feeling really good. Because if you wait until the next time you're feeling really stressed, maybe the next time an exam or an assignment comes around, you've got a deadline coming up. And then you say, oh yeah, I should really not eat the food right now and maybe do some yoga instead. But if you haven't got into the habit of doing that, you're probably not going to do it in the time that you're really feeling stressed. But you're more likely to engage in that healthy habit if you've already made a habit out of it. And then lastly, in this pathway is to reconnect and build a healthy relationship with food. So again, if um, people have been finding that they really have this emotional or stress relationship with food, it's important to recognize that it's not a matter of never eating those foods again that you tend to turn to when you're feeling stressed. Do try and aim for healthy eating choices about 90% of the time, but maybe the other 10% of the time you do enjoy your favorite treat foods. But I do encourage you to consume them for what they should be, and that's a gastronomic treat. So something that you really just love the taste of chocolate, and maybe like Sylvie mentioned, dark chocolate can be... Um, a great health food as well. So enjoying that when you feel like, you know, you want to treat, enjoy it without guilt, but don't use it as an emotional coping mechanism. Sorry, I've got a cat coming onto my screen. <laughs> so mindfulness and mindful eating is um, the next point. Now I'm going to kind of go through some uh, tips on mindfulness before we go into our mindful eating exercise. And I, maybe there's one more. Um, so a question, are there specific acupuncture points that would be easily accessible to self-administer? I'm not an expert in it, but yes, I know that there are. And there's definitely points um, in the face, for example, or if you feel tension headaches that are really easy, I think in the hands and the arms. Um, but acupuncturists would be great people to recommend on that. And maybe even in your kinesiology uh, department there, you might also have some advice on that and know more about it than I do. But I do know that there is definitely easy um, ways that you can practice that at home. Thank you for answering that. Um, we actually don't, that is not what kinesiology does. So that's why I'm asking. And okay. I do see one of my students who I know is an acupuncturist. So I'll be 
tapping into that source now that you have mentioned, um, since there are points that could be easily accessed by ourselves um, with the touch. So thank you. Yeah, of course, because I know um, here at our Somali, Susan Somali Integrative Health Institute here at UCI, part of the well-being services we offer to staff and faculty, actually, I do nutrition one-on-ones, for example, but then one of the acupuncturists will do one-on-one -on -one by Zoom acupressure sessions where they teach people how to um, utilize these points by themselves at home. So it's definitely um, doable. Um, I'm curious, how long does it take to break an unhealthy eating habit cycle? Is it possible to reduce a craving for a certain food? It's really different for everybody, but in general, I mean, kind of behavioral psychology traditionally would say it takes 21 days to break a ha to create a new habit or maybe break one. Um, and maybe it even takes longer, which might be a little bit depressing, but that's not to say that you won't have the food craving for 21 days or longer it'll become less over time so that usually if you're somebody who relies a lot on sugary foods there will be withdrawal symptoms and you know the first week could be really tricky um, but if you stick with it and really focus on your alternative stress management or distraction diversion tool it should make it easier rather than just sitting there and saying i'm not going to eat the cookies i'm not going to eat them you know if you've got something else to focus on that also helps the brain feel good that makes the whole process easier. Um, do you think everyone should try to practice intuitive eating? So there's a slight difference between um, intuitive and mindful eating, but I'm going to focus on mindful eating in this presentation. And intuitive eating is related in that it more just guides people on eating foods that their intuition sort of guides them towards. And I do think there's value in that, but I do also think that we need to be careful because, you know, if your brain is currently wired to feel like intuitively it wants sugar, then maybe our brain isn't guiding us in the best way at that moment. So I think that if you get to the place where you're really comfortable in healthy eating habits, then yes, intuitive eating is a good tool, but it might take a little while to get to that point where we feel like our intuition is telling us the right thing, if that makes sense. So I think mindful eating can actually be a bridge to get to that point. Um, okay, so. Karen, is it okay if I add anything in there really quickly? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, especially, I think, with the, with the idea of acupressure and creating good habits, um, when we outline some of the more self-care practices like yoga and in particular breathing exercises like pranayama, um, we're sort of training that ability to cultivate um, the ability to tap into our intuition a little bit more clearly. And I think you made a really good point there, Karen, where it's, if we're, if we're directly going straight to that place, um, there might be some other habits that we haven't quite cleared out um, previously that have required may potentially more work um, where our intuition is sort of guiding us perhaps not in the right direction that's going to be most beneficial for us. And I think when uh, Sylvie mentioned the idea of acupressure, when we are practicing yoga and we have a lot of availability for all of us to be able to practice here at Cypress College and, and also doing breathing exercises, we're also tapping into a lot of those acupressure points. Um, and in the, in the Chinese medicine system, which we call you know the meridian um, system, in, in yoga, we're doing that slightly differently. And the idea is that by, through more practice, we're able to tap into some of those points um, but it does take work and it does take effort to sort of lay the foundation for those healthy habits. So I just wanted to add that really quickly. Yeah, thank you. No, that's, a, that's a really great point. Um, so yes, as Sam alluded to, you know, is the more we engage in these practices, the more maybe our intuition becomes towards the healthier habits becomes clearer. And as I said, mindfulness, mindful eating is maybe a, one of those pathways to get there. And I think mindfulness can incorporate yoga for example, yoga is a mindful practice in its own right. Um, but in general, mindfulness really focuses on these four qualities. So presence, awareness, relaxation, and kindness, like self-kindness and to others. And these are some of the different ways that we can engage in mindfulness in our daily life, including meditation, yoga, the breath, um, other stress management tools that I mentioned earlier, and just being aware of how we feel, that's being mindful, just reflecting on, you know, I'm feeling kind of stressed right now, I'm feeling down, that's being mindful of your own emotions. Um, so 
these are all simple techniques that, um, I mean, some might be more complex than others, but in general, there is an element of simple simplicity to it that can help bring awareness to our current emotions, sensations, surroundings, and behaviors. And um, different types of mindfulness to some degree are accessible to all individuals from children to elderly. I mean, thinking about breathing, for example, that's really accessible to everybody. Um, helping, it helps to dissipate emotional and physical stress. There's growing evidence for positive metabolic health benefits as well. So it's not just psychological benefits, but it actually physiologically, the more we engage in these practices, research shows that it influences our biology as well. And, you know, from a nutritional perspective, there's growing evidence that it can help not only maybe our food choices, but also how our body handles food when we eat it. And then there is that potential to influence nutrition via stress reduction. So the more we engage in mindfulness practices, the more maybe at ease and peace we'll feel. And that then helps us to be more, maybe intuitive is the right word there, about the type of nourishment that our body needs and also can aid digestion as well. So um, like I mentioned at the very beginning of this presentation, all those bi-directional relationships between the brain and the gut, one of them is, you know, for example, if you feel really stressed or anxious, sometimes you get butterflies in your stomach or cramps, and that can also be mitigated by mindfulness practice as well. So what is mindful eating? It is one branch of mindfulness practice, and it's the process of paying attention to your eating experience without judgment. So being slowing down, being really present with your food, using all your senses to experience the process of eating. And just to consider maybe how do you currently eat? So here's just a little chart of comparing mindless eating to mindful eating. So mindless can be eating past full, ignoring your body's signal. So you finish a meal and then you realize you're really stuffed because you didn't listen to when your body was actually full, maybe 10 minutes earlier. Um, eating when your emotions tell us to eat. So for, like I've been talking about all along, you know, different stress, boredom is even a big one as well for eating sad, lonely, etc. Rather than when our bodies tell us to eat for reasons of like hunger or we, our energy is low and we actually need some fuel. Um, eating not necessarily eating alone. I don't want to highlight that that's a mindless eating practice because we can be mindful eating alone. But um, if it's at times maybe when uh, there isn't really a meal and you're just sort of, again, maybe snacking out of boredom or loneliness, but also random times and places. So um, eating, you know, in a kitchen or at a dining room or off a plate is more mindful eating than mindless. And then eating foods that are emotionally comforting versus eating foods that are actually nutritionally healthy for our bodies. Eating and multitasking is probably one of the biggest mindless eating practices that we have today, especially with technology. And, you know, I'm guilty of it as well, eating in front of the computer, having the smartphones around us, and we're just bombarded with other distractions all the time, uh, rather than just eating, just actually sitting and eating <laughs> rather than doing something else at the same time. And considering a meal an end product is so just something sort of, you know, th this food just came from the store, for example, rather than where did all the ingredients of this meal come from? How did they get from the ground, perhaps to my plate? What was involved in that process? It's being mindful about the food as well. Um, so many benefits of mindful eating have been studied so far in um, scientific research. So it builds an awareness of our true appetite when we're really full or when we're really hungry that helps with portion size regulation because we naturally start to maybe finish eating when we're really full rather than overeating and maybe choosing smaller portions in the first place over time better digestion like i mentioned slowing down and maybe our stomach and our intestines are more relaxed and less stressed so they are better able to digest food break down stress eating habits over time because we are more in tune with when our body really needs foods versus when we are just maybe stressed or bored. Um, building a natural desire for nourishing foods will also come over time. And that's kind of getting more towards the intuitive eating. Why, you know, after a while of engaging in more mindful eating practices, our body starts to realize well, what food um, is nourishing for it and might start to actually crave those foods more than the less healthy foods. And it also teaches us to enjoy food without guilt. And that can go for both healthy and less healthy foods because we don't have to eat perfectly healthy all of the time. We can still enjoy some of maybe those higher sugar treat foods. But like I mentioned earlier, enjoy them for what they should be, a gastronomic treat and not for an emotional coping mechanism. 
So now we are going to go into a little mindfulness practice. So I'm going to invite any of you there, hopefully most of you maybe have another bite-sized piece of food, a snack of some sort. Um, and I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for the moment. Um, so I invite you to take that food. I didn't specify if that food should be like a handheld snack, preferably it would be, but it's okay if you're eating something that requires a fork or a spoon. Okay, so first of all, we're just going to start with taking a deep breath. So inhale slowly and exhale slowly. And then look at the food that you have in front of you. Just take note of it, don't even touch it yet. What color is it? What does the surface look like? What do you notice about it? And if you're to take it into your hand, what is the texture like? What does it feel like? If you rub it between your fingers, do you have any thoughts occurring in your mind right now about your opinion of that food, if you like it or if you dislike it? And don't really give much uh, weight to those thoughts or feelings you might be having, just notice if anything arises. And become aware if you have a desire to start eating the food. And how does that feel in your body? Like, is your stomach rumbling? Is your mouth watering? And then start to think about the process of putting it in your mouth. So it, it takes some effort from your body. It requires you moving a hand to your mouth. And just be aware of that motion as you do so. Now put the food close to your mouth and smell it first before you put it in. Does it have a smell? And um, did you notice that smell before? Do you have any reaction to that smell? Is it causing your mouth to water? Maybe even stomach rumbling again? And what does it feel like to want to eat that food? Now go ahead and put the piece of food in your mouth, place it on your tongue, but don't chew yet. What does it feel like there? Um, again, is your mouth watering? Are there any sensations? Is there any taste yet from just having the food on your tongue before you even bite into it? Just notice those things. And now bite into the piece of food. Uh, just begin slowly. So chew slowly. Any other sensations you're getting now? Any different feelings when it's between your teeth? Do you notice taste arising on certain parts of your tongue? maybe the front or the back or the sides of your tongue, for example, and what, what does that taste like? And also just pay attention to the rest of your body. That arm, that hand that you lifted to put the food in your mouth, where is that now? And did you even notice moving it again? So as you continue to chew slowly and experience the different tastes and other sensations, notice that you might have an impulse to swallow now you can go ahead and swallow the food, but try to be aware of that piece of food as it moves down your esophagus towards your stomach. Do you have any other sensations as that's movement going down? Do you have any sense of how that feels in your stomach now? Do you notice that maybe your stomach feels unnecessarily full, but can you imagine that your stomach is that little bit more full now than before you ate that piece of food. Okay. So hopefully at least some people here in the audience had a piece of food available to them to practice with. And now we are gonna get ready for some breakout rooms. So I want, um, even if you didn't have a piece of food to practice with there, just based on the guided mindful eating practice, maybe you'll have some, you know, feedback or ideas of if you were eating a food at that time um, to answer these questions. So how did this experience differ from the way you usually eat food? And compared to when I asked you to eat the piece of food at the beginning of this workshop, what are the different sensations or things that you noticed when we went through the mindful eating practice versus the the just usual way. And did you notice if you felt satisfied eating just one bite of that piece of food or snack? I mean, 
after doing it slowly and mindfully, how much are you still craving more of it? And maybe you are, that's okay. And imagine what would it be like if you ate this way most of the time for most of your meals and snacks? Do you think it would affect the amount and or the types of foods that you choose to eat? Would it change your attitude, your attitude towards eating or maybe certain times of the day of eating? So um, I think we're going to go, Sam might help put us into breakout rooms of everything, groups of maybe four or five people and take some summary points. Um, so just to recap basically on this presentation so far. So psychological stress creates a biochemical response that leads to cravings for foods that are high in sugar or fat, and simple carbohydrates most frequently. Um, comfort eating with unhealthy foods is only a short-term fix, but has long-term health consequences. Consuming nutrient-dense foods that include vegetables, fruits, whole grains, eggs, fish, nuts, and seeds, they can help improve our mood and maybe decrease stress levels by promoting healthy stress management and um, better signals in the brain, better balance of our neurotransmitters and hormones. And it is possible to rewire our brain to positively deal with stress through non-food related wellness approaches. So they were those diversion tactics um, that I talked about that when we are under stress or feel like food cravings are really strong, try and divert the brain from focusing on food through other things that actually help decrease the stress response. And then mindful eating is a simple tool that helps us reconnect to food, builds awareness of our body's own hunger and fullness signals, and can help us overcome stress or emotional eating behaviors. So that is everything I have for you today. Thank you so much to everybody for being here and such great participation, great comments, great questions. Um, it was really nice to engage with everybody.